We've heard about hope and the victories there. Today, we want to hear about the 80s. My first Bible talk was in 1977 at Abilene Christian University. And uh, then the first church service I ever went to, uh, Tom Brown was the preacher in Boulder, Colorado, where I was at the University of Colorado. And I got excited about my faith. And, uh, but I, I didn't join up with Tom's church there, but I, I did start reading the Bible and I did make a great decision to date this wonderful, young, beautiful, spiritual, very spiritual woman. <laughs> and um, I went back to Abilene and I got, I got a degree in theology and Bible, and I got that degree before it was cool. And uh, so I was, I graduated in 19, we married and graduated in 1981. And so, um, so this is, uh, this is us in 1981, and it was while we were in Abilene that, uh, yeah, as uh, Indiana Jones said, Doug, it's, it's not the years, it's the mileage. Uh, so the hair, well, man, uh, that hair is something else. I tell you, man. Um, so while at Abilene, that's when we joined the Crossroads, which became the Boston, which became the discipling movement that we're all a part of today. When we left after graduation in 81, we went to North Carolina. We were a part of the Triangle Mission planting there in North Carolina. I was the Duke University campus minister. And uh, Doug, of course, went to Duke. Doug and I have this intersectionality in our lives. We've never lived in the same city at the same time, but there's all these intersections. Ambergeet worked because I had raised, we had raised support, but we could not, we didn't have enough that she... Uh, that she could work in the ministry. So I was the Duke University campus minister. But we saw the need to move to Boston to train for the ministry. And so we got up and we moved in 1982 that summer. Actually, first day I was there, I met Doug Arthur. And uh, we, we wanted more training, and that's what was going on in Boston. I, I would say the about the 80s, that our movement in the 80s, if I was to describe it when the 80s began, you had a small church in Boston and a small church in Chicago that had just been planted. And then you had the Crossroads churches, uh, those affiliated with, cross, uh, with Crossroads uh, that were across the USA. That was the situation. But something special was happening in Boston because, uh, because we were now seeing an entire congregation that was striving to be totally committed uh, to Jesus. So people were, were moving to Boston to train and to get united. And I mean, literally, like every week, people were moving in to get trained and to learn. Uh, 1982, our first Sunday service when we moved there uh, was uh, the send off for the Arthurs uh, to London. And so the Boston church planted the, uh, uh, the congregation in London. And in 1982, our, our budding New Boston movement now had three churches, London, Chicago, and uh, of course, Boston. Now, I, I would, I mean, I'll just, I, I'll say from my viewpoint that many of the Crossroads guys were now in the process of, of coming together under, say, the Boston leadership or the Bo coming into the Boston tent. Uh, and over the next several years, what you saw was those that were out and who had led we're finding their way back into affiliation, and we were becoming unified as a Boston movement. So we began the decade with just, you know, just a few hundred members in, uh, in Boston, Chicago, and then, of course, London was the next planting. Um, but during the one year that we lived in Boston from 82 until 83, during that 12-month period, the church went from 500 to 1,000 members during that time. We went on the New York City team in 1983. We were the 17th and 18th member, the final two. And then we went to Brazil in 1986 uh, for a language internship, moved to Brazil in 87, and then on to Africa in 89. We're very appreciative of, of uh, New York and the, the, the church there in New York City. So by 1991, at the, at the end of the decade, because I have these official stats from 1991, we had 103 churches worldwide, 57 outside the USA, 46 churches in the inside the USA. So we now had more outside than inside. Boston had now grown to 3,500 members and Chicago to 1,750. 
it was a, and I chose my words carefully, a huge calculated international planting project to reach all the world, the key world cities. It was amazing what took place. Um, in 1991 alone, we baptized as a movement 22,000 people, just as a for instance. We now had 37,000 members worldwide and our attendance worldwide was 47,000. Um, it, was, it was just amazing what God was doing. Now, um, like today, we had our problems. And uh, I know that in 1991, I know that year, 13,000 people left the church. Uh, so, you know, we would baptize 22,000, 13,000 leave. And we were functioning under the leadership of one person, one man. Those problems would become more evident later. But to sum it up, I would say the 80s was a time when a scattered crossroads movement became unified and organized with the Boston movement. And then we began to send out church plantings purposefully and strategically around the world. Uh, churches cooperated financially, and the results, I believe, we believe, were a stunning victory for God and his people. Amazing stuff. Now, Sao Paulo was the ninth church of our movement. And so we arrived in Sao Paulo in 1986 for the internship and then 1987 with our permanent uh, visas. And so this is a view of Sao Paulo, one of the five largest cities on the planet. It is literally a sea of skyscrapers. It just goes and goes and goes. It's a beautiful city, a beautiful culture. And Brigitte and I speak Portuguese fluently um, and we loved our time there. We learned it in order to go there. Uh, Matthew, our firstborn there, was born in, uh, in Sao Paulo. And uh, for us, we just, we had a fantastic time there. The, the, the two years that we spent were wonderful. We met at this, uh, at this Methodist church building in, in Sao Paulo. They were happy enough to rent to us. And this is what it looked like inside, uh, you know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes after church, everybody just hanging out. Uh, as the team and people that are studying the Bible. And in that picture are future evangelists and all kinds of people that were just hanging out after an early church service. Well, to describe the work, you can't really describe, um, uh, you, you, can't, you can't go too far without talking about the concept of training and how important it was, uh, what training. It was training that got us there, but it was training also that from the beginning we were concerned about. You know, was it, it, it's about baptizing for sure, but it's about training and raising up leaders. Um, you've got to have that strong skeleton to hang that growing body on as it grows and grows. I think about Jim Brown, Rolando Gonzalez, Marty West, Lou Garcia. Uh, these are guys that went on the team together. And, uh, you know, it's quite a memory. You look back that first year, we baptized 50 men. We baptized 50 men but we didn't want to just baptize 50 men again the following year. And we knew we needed to find those guys that were those that were among that group and begin to raise them up uh, for the following year. Cause we wanted to have 200 baptisms the second year. So training became crucial. Every Sunday night, the men were in one room in our apartment, the women uh, leaders were in the other, and we were training them, talking to them about the ministry. And, uh, and Amber, she's going to share in just a moment. People like Edson, Alcides, Dacio, Ettore, uh, Jim Brown, Rolando, these guys, they rose to the occasion and served full-time in the ministry in Brazil. It was quite an amazing group of people to come from those early days. We worked hard to train them, to know how to count the cost, to know how to do the basics of counseling, to know how to give a lesson and to love God and to just be humble and open and eager to teach and wanting to learn. So we did have 200 baptisms that second year. It was an amazing beginning for the church. And these guys served in the, and there's a parallel story with every guy for a woman. And I think the most important test of your leadership is always what happens after you leave. And of course, Jesus is an amazing example. Hey, we've been together 36 months. I'm out of here. You guys take the world, and they did an amazing job, the impact of his ministry. 
who are you training up to lead? Um, we always asked back in the day, all the old timers, we know that we spoke to each other. Well, as we had, we after, with, before a half an hour of a conversation is over, it's, hey, how are your guys? Bro, how are your guys doing? How's this guy, this guy, this guy? It was so important to our work, the men and the women that we were raising up. Are you producing leaders? If not, why not? Okay. You got to lower your defenses. You've got to ask questions. You've got to seek answers and you've got to get training. You got to get training and then you got to turn around and give it as Jesus, uh, as Jesus illustrates in Mark chapter three, so beautifully. We want to make sure that we are training. The other thing we want to do is make sure that we're building family. Um, you know, Paul says in First Thessalonians 2, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And I think that that was so important. Um, it's been important everywhere we've been. But in Sao Paulo, it was so important. Um, you know, yes, we baptized a lot of people. Um, but the people that we baptized and worked with were not a means to an end for more baptisms, right? And I think it's easy to get into that. They were family. They were in our homes. We were in their homes. We were getting to know them. We were loving them, sharing the gospel with them. Um, I think it's so important that no matter where you are or no matter where you're going, that that is a crucial, crucial part of, of your building. You know, when we went to Sao Paulo, one of the mistakes that I made early on um, is I was looking to who was going to be, I, I had such deep, close friendships in New York City. And so what I would do is I'd look at the women and say, okay, who's going to be my Lee Kennard? Who's going to be my Stacy Fridley? Who's going to replace that relationship? And it put undue pressure on the relationship. And it also wasn't wise at all. And I remember having a talk with Lisa Johnson, who discipled us at the time, or she discipled me. And the whole idea is you never replace friendships, you just enlarge. These people are going to be their own individuals and, and their own individual friendship. And I think that's so important because we can move to a different city, move to a different ministry and make ourselves lonely by looking to see who's going to replace who I left behind instead of enlarging the family. Each new place you go is an opportunity for a larger family, not for a different family. And I think that that's really important as you go into these mission cities, Bible talks, wherever you, that you're looking to build new family, new relationships that you, that that's so, so crucial. I mean, one of the reasons that Mike could go in 03 when things were pretty crazy in Sao Paulo is because we had built loving friendships based on Jesus, not based on what people can produce, not based on what the, what the church is doing. And I think that that's so important because we can feel pressure sometimes and people become a means to an end instead of part of the family. And that was such a crucial thing mm -hmm. uh, early on in Sao Paulo. Okay. Uh, the Brazilian church, you know, it, it's had, they've had a rough decade in terms of growth the last actually 15 years. So we're very excited that the hopefully a, a great step forward is we've been able to send Jeff and Amanda Henderson, and this is them with their three kids at the airport in San Antonio. They've landed safely during one of the worst pandemics in Brazil's history, but they've had their shots and, uh, and they're hard at work now just learning the language and getting going in Brazil. So this story continues to be written, and I know God's going to do great things. In 1989, we moved to Africa. Uh, Boston had had graciously planted the church in Johannesburg in uh, 19. Americans always think it's Johannesburg, but anyway, uh, everybody there says Johannesburg. But the um, in 1989 we came and we planted Nairobi, Harare, and Abidjan, and then the London church. Thank you, Doug. Planted Lagos, Nigeria, and so a lot began to happen in 1989. It was a big year for Africa. Um, churches cooperated, some large special contributions each year supported the work, and the churches began to take root. So we spent time in Harare, Nairobi, and we're going to focus on Abidjan in the Ivory Coast. Uh, Amber is, uh, she is French. Her French is excellent. My French is terrible. I learned uh, two and a half languages on the mission field. I say French. French is about a half, okay? But um, if I'd had more time, I think I'd have got it. But anyway, there we go. Abidjan is a beautiful city on the tropical West African coast. 
And um, and you see the here's the team. Look at this picture of Hervé and Janet uh, next to Hervé and uh, next to Amber Jean. And there's me holding our firstborn, Matthew. OK, so uh, one of the things that was oh, here's when Nathan was born. Our second child was born. And we're going to start off by talking about embracing the differences. You know, uh, we lived right in downtown Abidjan, right? And so um, it was, <laughs> I, I remember getting very used to the whole environment in West Africa. And I actually was sitting in my dining room one day and I was um, thinking about my sister who lives in the suburbs of Dallas, very, very American uh, city and uh, environment. And I was thinking, you know, if she came here, probably, I mean, I don't think it would I don't think it'd be that different. I think she'd be okay. At the very moment I thought that, okay, now I remind you, I'm living in downtown Abidjan, or we are, and at that very moment, a Malian nomad with his robes and his turban walks down the middle of the street with his, ho with his herd, herd of goats. And I thought, no, no, I, I think it's really, really different here. And I think one of the things <laughs> that we really learned was to embrace the differences, to love learning the culture where you are, to figure out what you love and to focus on those things. There will be things, no matter where you live, that are not like where you're from. It might be the food, it might be the roads, it might be the living conditions. It, it'll certainly be the people, it'll be the language sometimes. And I think so often we, we, we can hurt ourselves by wanting the place that we moved to to be like what we left instead of really embracing the differences. There's a television show on in the States right now called House Hunters International. And you've got these internationals going around the world because they want this experience, but always one, one of the people in it complains about well, why aren't there any lines in the road? And why are the bathrooms set up this way? And me, 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 me. And you're like, you know, you like you move to another country. It's gonna be different. And I think um, it just embrace those. Um, you know, many young children in the U.S. Some of their first words are dog and cat and bird. And uh, our Matthews first words for animals were bat. Um, chicken and lizard because they were all running around in downtown Abidjan, right? It wasn't, so it was bat, lizard and chicken. And, but to embrace the differences, the difference, you know, we would walk into, um, we'd reach out to people that worked at the American embassy and we'd walk into their homes and I'd feel like we were walking onto a stage set of a film because it'd be like, wait a minute. Of a U.S. Of, house. Of a U.S. house. Um, where do we just walk into and, and really keeping themselves distant? And I want to encourage you that wherever you move to embrace the differences, to not lament what you've left behind, to anticipate that it's going to be different and to learn to love them, to learn to love the food. We ate worms and crickets and uh, crocodile. And I mean, things I had never eaten before, right? I, I can't say I honestly continued eating worms, but, but we did try them. Um, and, but I think, you know, Mike's, Mike's eaten a goat's eye. I mean, we, 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 we experienced, um, things we wanted to understand and to become a part of the culture, not to keep ourselves separate. And I think that's so important when you go places. Absolutely. You got to have some bunny worms. You got to go to the, uh, the goat hunter in Lagos and have the goat's eye. Yeah. Uh, you've got to, you know, I remember, I'm <laughs> there's so many things uh, eating a live beetle, you know, it's kind of, that's kind of, it's kind of crunchy, but you don't have to floss afterwards because the <laughs> legs keep moving. Anyway, it's uh, never a dull moment. And Jesus did the biggest culture change, right? Leaving heaven. And I think was such a great Absolutely. example for us. Yeah. Absolutely. Me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that we learn also is, to expect miracles. Um, I also want to mention that in that tree right, right behind us in the picture, that tree was filled. I thought it was filled for months. I thought it was a big flock of birds. And then I realized that's a big flock of bats that lived in that tree. They would roost in that tree every night. And, uh, and the kids would go around with slingshots and they would, you know, uh, they, they would hit the bat, knock it down, and then they would cook the bats and sell it. And I thought, Oh, wow. I'm a long way from the United States to this. I haven't seen this back in Texas or wherever, man. So anyway, it's fun. Africa is fun. Uh, Africa is never a dull moment. Never. Um, and I think one of the things we have to have, and that I, I like this spirit among 
us in this group here that's on this phone. I like it. I think that spirit is there. And it's the spirit to expect miracles. Like, come on, this is God. Of course, we're going to see a miracle. Nothing is going to stand in our way. Um, it reminds me of another decade, the 530s BC, when God was moving in so many amazing ways. Here, they've come to the end of the exile. They've been there for 70 years. Jeremiah had said at 70 years, this will be over. And they've got no money. They got no army. They have no transportation. They have no answers. And the answer was that Cyrus, the king, the Persian king himself says, I'm going to send you home. You're going to rebuild that temple. You're going to go back. Anybody can leave and, and, and local Persians can support you. And hey, I'm contributing myself. We'll see you guys later. It's time to go back. And it is just so amazing. Who would have thought this? And God always has a miracle waiting for the faithful. Um, you know, you've just got to expect miracles. And we need to think big. God solves problems. He's an amazing problem solver. And he doesn't want us thinking our job is to identify problems. Oh, well, we have this problem. We have that problem. Anybody can do that. What we're paid to do is to trust God and solve those problems. That's what God is, the problem solver. And so it's just amazing the giver of, he plows through every problem situation and leads us to the end. I'm not saying there's not times of tears. We've had our times of tears, all of us. There have been days where we were afraid or we cried, but but God comes through, and that's the point. In the book of Ezra, there's actually three letters from kings, pagan Persian kings, who get behind the effort right at the right moment, whether it's Cyrus, Darius, or Artaxerxes. They write these letters saying, we're behind you. Now go over there and get it done. And, and I just think it's a cool thing that, that Egypt paid for the exodus, that ravens brought food for the prophet, that one boy's lunch fed 5,000, that pagan kings out of the blue paid for the return and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Stop thinking that God can't. And always remember that God can, yeah. and in fact, insists that he work among faithful people. That's, it's his church and he loves that church more than you and I. So today in Africa, there's 99 churches. And, and we're just, we're so proud of all the, the, everyone on this phone call from Africa. We love you. We're so proud of the way that across the, across the continent, African elders, evangelists, women's ministry leaders, African administration, boards, deacons, everything, teachers, schools of missions. It's beautiful. In 38 countries, 13,000 plus members, and almost 19,000 in attendance. We are thankful God continues to work, and I hope that we'll take these lessons from the 80s and put them to work right now in our decade.